Did you know formaldehyde can enter a home through products like engineered wood furniture, computers, carpeting, treated fabrics, hairsprays, and cleaning materials? These potentially harmful VOCs can circulate throughout indoor living spaces and affect the air you breathe. According to the EPA, poor indoor air quality has been linked to headaches, fatigue, allergies, asthma, and more. The good news is you can ensure your client's air is clean with Certainty Air Renew Drywall. Air Renew Indoor Air Quality Drywall is the first of its kind patent pending drywall that actively cleans the air by permanently removing formaldehyde. When airborne formaldehyde comes in contact with the board through normal air circulation, Air Renew Drywall captures the formaldehyde and converts it into a safe inert compound, keeping it safely within the drywall. Air Renew Drywall cuts, installs, and finishes just like a regular drywall and comes in type X, moisture, and mold resistant for multiple solutions. The board looks, installs, and finishes just like standard drywall. It also is available in MT2 Tech Moisture and Mold Resistant and Type X, so it can help fit multiple. Indoor air performance tests prove that Air Renew permanently removes formaldehyde. It has been validated by their ULE through their Environmental Claims Validations Program. It works with most water-based acrylic and epoxy-based paints. Go ahead and check out Certainteed St. Gobain Air Renew uh, VOC eating drywall today. So in the summer of 2017, we were invited to come out during the um, Illinois USGBC's uh, Green Built Home Tour. And so I was excited to meet a lot of um, homeowners, builders, developers, architects, and see passion, their passion and action for making homes better. Um, this particular home was really exciting. And uh, we got behind the scenes um, right as they were finishing up the renovation process of Chicago's first uh, passive house renovation. So we're really excited. I hope you'll join us. Um, this course is approved for one hour in continuing education units in uh, many different programs and is approved for one hour in health, uh, welfare, and safety under the AIA, as well as may be applicable for your local state design or contractor license. Uh, I'm Brett Little. I'm the executive director at the Green Home Institute. I'm the moderator and filmer during this session. And the Green Home Institute is a nonprofit with a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. Uh, this this program uh, this house uh, was really neat. Um, again, it's Chicago's first uh, pending certification as the time of this recording. Um, for a Passive House uh, Enterfit under the Passive House International uh, program, Passive House Institute International. And so real exciting, we get to see um, somewhat behind the siding, which is cool for the thermal envelope, um, the water management system. We get to see the ventilation system, uh, some of the finishes and features, um, and really get to sit down and talk with the developer as to why they did this, and especially why they did this on spec uh, before they even had um, a homeowner. So I hope you'll enjoy it as much as we did filming it, and um, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Mike Connors. I'm the founder of KenwoodPassiveHouse.com. This is 5485 South Ellis Avenue, Chicago, Illinois. Uh, it's an 1890s graystone row house. It's approximately uh, 100 feet north of the first atomic uh, nuclear reaction on the University of Chicago campus. Those buildings in the background are the science buildings. That's the main gym. and the. Uh, University of Chicago hospitals just behind the main gym. So this is this is called the, the campus district, North Campus, and uh, it's a great location and here we are. So I bought this property for redevelopment purposes in uh, August of 2015. I didn't have an expectation at the time that I would uh, do anything related to the Passive House Building Standard, Passive House Institute Building Standard. At the time, I didn't even know who the Passive House Institute was. But this is a Passive House Institute Enerfit renovation. Uh, it's the first Passive House Institute certified building 
in Chicago. It will be when it's when we complete. And it'll be obviously the first Passive House Institute Interfit renovation. So there's uh, Passive House Institute has different uh, air tightness and energy standards for new construction and uh, the Interfit renovation. <coughs> new construction is 4.75 kbtu per square foot per year and 0.6 ACH at Pascal 50, that's air tightness. Uh, and for uh, renovation, it's 7.92 kbtu per square foot per year and 1.0 ACH at Pascal 50. Now the only ACH test that matters is the final ACH test, the final blower door test. We're nearing completion on this project. I expect it will be done in two months and we'll do a final blower door. But we've done two so far on a formal basis. The first was 0.36 ACH at Pascal 50. The second pre-drywall was 0.27 ACH at Pascal 50. And uh, you know, so we have every expectation that we'll do as good or better. Hopefully, hopefully we can hold the standard because there have been no, there were no additional uh, roof penetrations and uh, wall penetrations. So um, let's start here and talk about all our wonderful green features. I'm born and raised in Northern California, so I'm very sensitive to the landscape and trees in particular. Uh, and we've designed this. Uh, this is low maintenance, uh, low maintenance landscaping. These are grasses, uh, perennials, and these are maple trees, uh, new specimen maple trees. They're uh, Armstrong, um, autumn gold or autumn red, autumn something or other. They're bright red. They're beautiful in the in the fall. And behind it, we have some more. We have some. Uh, Winter creeper, more grasses, more perennials, and use those are very good in this climate. Um, that's a yellow maple, and this uh, these steps, by the way. So we we renovated the the first thing we did was among the first things we did was the renovation of the limestone facade <coughs> and uh, in the course of doing that <coughs> we were going to we planned on renovating the uh, uh, the front stairs but they were so degraded that we took them out and this detail by the way is it's from the IIT uh, Mies, it's a Mies van der Rohe signature detail you can go see it in its in its true glory uh, over at the uh, Illinois Institute of Technology. <coughs> so we replicated that. And um, we might as well take a look real quick here at the, uh, the windows and doors. These are, these windows and doors, sorry. These windows and doors are uh, manufactured by Munster Joinery, uh, which is in Ireland. Uh, it's a Passive House Institute certified component. We've used as many Passive House Institute certified components as we possibly can. Um, they went in super easy. Uh, they've, they're, you know, I have their triple pane, uh, the uh, solar gain heat coefficient, SHGC, did I say that right? SHGC is uh, 0 0.5, maybe 0 0.55, I forget. but. Um, the R value is around uh, just under eight, and um, you know they were a little frustrating to deal with importing the windows, uh, but no complaints so far, uh, and went in super easy. You can see in the front, we haven't trimmed it out yet. We haven't fin finished the window trimming, um, but you can see as we go through the house, you'll see extensive use of Proclima uh, products, tapes, caulks, membranes in particular. Those were sourced through 475 Building Supply. I can't say enough good things about them. They've been great friends and great educators. So thank God for them. And um, I want to 
want to back up a little bit and see if you can get a shot of, of this. We've, we're going to start the exterior cladding of, the, of this house. Uh, in, you know, we were supposed to start this week, but you know how construction goes. Uh, but we've, we, we entirely reconditioned this exterior elevation. It was brick, it is brick three widths of brick and we reconditioned it, rebuilt it where necessary, uh, added on the outside, this is, you can see this pink, we call it pink paint, it's not paint really, it's the Prosoco brand liquid applied air barrier and uh, then we, we've, we've so far clad the vast majority of the building in Roxel uh, three inches of Roxel insulation, some, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> three inches of Roxel insulation at least, <coughs> and then the wood battens are here, we have to finish that off, and uh, once that's done, we'll uh, clad this in Sembrit brand Minaret HD uh, uh, fiber cement boards architecturally designed large panels. They're actually gonna to ship today. <coughs> they come from the distributors in Pennsylvania. And um, looking forward to getting that part done because it's been, it's been really, you know, we could have used hardy board. Hardy board is at best medium density. I think of it as paper mache. I really shouldn't say bad things. But the Sembrit HD is used throughout uh, the, uh, Europe, it, it's absolutely rugged uh, in every climate zone from marine to alpine. Uh, and it's, you know, very excited about getting that up. Oh. It'll be an open rain screen. So, and uh, just just like, just like you know, as as is done so many times in Europe. What, um, and just for those who don't know what uh, rock wool is, or okay. rock soul is, sorry, yeah. I just gave it away, but yeah. uh, what, what is it real quick and, um, you know, how to, it doesn't, so, doesn't get usually get used, does it? Well, I I don't know. I I think it's used. We there was a, a, a new building across the street by Genie Gang, and you're seeing it. It's growth. If, let's put it this way: as an investor, which I was for 30 years, a professional investor, I'd like to. I'd seriously like to take a look at Roxel stock because it's a fantastic product, and the the new high student dormitory high rise across the street. They underneath their fancy uh, cladding, it's all Roxel. Mm -hmm. So Roxel is uh, Roxel is called the generic name is uh, mineral wool or rock wool. It's a combination of uh, steel slag and stone. It's non. It doesn't burn. Mm -hmm. The the if you want to watch some really interesting videos, go to YouTube. Rock Google Roxel. You'll see these fire department, multiple fire departments and fire professionals have, have done some amazing demonstrations. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't burn. So it's also a fantastic insulator, about R4, depending on which Roxel product, but you know, it's probably R4 with low of 3.8, 3, high of 4.3, 4 something like that. So it's comparable to dense pack cellulose, which we've also used, but on the inside. So we put this on the outside and uh, it goes all the way down to below the footings and uh, it's part of our it's part of the the whole protocol passive house institute protocol which requires continuous insulation and re also requires a continuous air and water barrier so we have we sort of have taken in this project because it's the first one i've ever done uh the belt you know sort of redundant belts and suspenders approach because uh, we have we have uh, multiple uh, our walls are 80 percent vapor open we'll talk about that more inside but the walls are when I say 80 percent I should say 80 percent of the walls are 100 percent vapor open so in this section here all the way down to uh, basically all but the last 16 feet uh, of the structure it's vapor open wall assembly uh, uh, 100 percent the the last 16 feet we we chose to use and we 
We, we had basically, we didn't have too much of a choice. We had a, a site condition, setback condition. We only had three inches to work mm -hmm. with. We went with Hunter Poly ISO, which was very easy to work with. Mm -hmm. And, but that's a paper closed product, mm -hmm. obviously. But it's three inch, inches of insulation of Poly ISO on the outside. So that's R22 insulation on the outside. And on the inside, we, we have uh, in that area, probably an average of six inches of, uh, of uh, dense pack cellulose. Mm -hmm. So, and on the inside of, of the rest of the section, it's probably an average of five inches of dense pack cellulose. Why do I say in this front here, since we didn't do anything to the facade, the wall interior to that, it's, it's eight inches of dense pack cellulose in some places. Yeah. Why are these, why vary? Well, this is, this is, this house was built in 1890. Mm -hmm. Its walls are not straight. Its walls are not plumb. You know, they're sort of like snake-like and bend in and out. You know, you, you, you might want to only use four inches of dense pack cellulose, but if you want your wall straight, you have to stand off. In fact, the more you stand off, the more insulation you get. But in this particular house, we want it to be a standoff as least as possible because it's a rather narrow house. It's only 17 feet wide. Hmm. So every inch was valuable to us. Let's go so, take a look, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> we're gonna go in, it's gonna be nice and air conditioned. It's extremely hot and humid today. It's probably close to 90 degrees and who knows what the humidity is but the first thing that we're going to see is urban sourced uh, white oak plank flooring so uh, I love it um, these trees were felled from uh, were felled from Evanston they came from Evanston which is Evanston, 10, Illinois, uh, Evanston, yeah. 10 miles north of here I don't know five miles is the local trend these days right <laughs> Back again. So, um, can we bring the camera just around here for a sec? I want to, we missed something on the way. I want to just address it. Um, this, this is what it's going to look like when it's finished, uh, interior finishes. We're going to go into this area next. And this is the staircase right there going up. And this is our beautiful backyard. And this is the Chicago skyline. This is the thermal image of the Chicago skyline. This is why we do what we do. We want to make this blue. We, we don't want to see the skyline. We want the skyline to, we want the buildings to be as blue as the skyline. Okay. So, coming around into the living room here, we have, uh, this, this is, uh, these were taken with uh, my, my new toy, my FLIR uh, iOS. Uh, camera. It was uh, evening. It was about 20 degrees outside, and this this is the this is where we were outside. This is we're standing right here in the in the front area. We came in that door. This house is uh, non-habited, uninhabited. No energy in that whatsoever. It hasn't been that way for several months, or it has been that way for several months. And these are, these are the neighboring row houses. So this house, these, I don't know how high their temp, you know, what their temperature is set at, but this was 68 degrees. And um, it was 68 degrees. And so there it is, you know, there's our blue, there's our blue exterior. This is a car engine, you know, and this is the house, the single family house across the street, all taken the same time. Uh, and so this is the blue trees in the background between the two adjacent properties. We got a, got several pictures like that. <laughs> We're going to have a monitor here where we can run um, a tour. Oh, we'll get to that up there. It's called a Matterport tour. It's thank God we found that. That's uh, really really interesting technology for this business as you. You can run Matterport tours at different stages of the business or Matterport sessions at different points of the business and get a photographic image 
ID and what and what the property is actually doing. And we'll share a link with everybody on that. Yeah, is that good? for right. sure. You can go to Kenwood Passive House. You can go in section two to the virtual tour, and it's there. The link is there. We'll, uh, we're working on an icon that'll be more easy to address to access with your cell phone. So this is China. Uh, this is there's 32 cities in China that are bigger than Chicago, and this is not an abnormal condition. This is this is smog, and you know, sadly that's that's what's going on. That's why they're the number one producer and the masters of photovoltaic panels because they have to be. So we're going to go up to the very top, which is the third floor, and we're going to pause there for a sec and take a look at our take a look at this house. This is the basement level. This is we're standing right there right now. And we're going to go up these stairs. Master bedroom, bath and closets. We're going to go back. We're going to go up the staircase to this, come up around the back, come here to this landing. And we're going to go to our Zender mechanical room. And then we're going to come back down and talk about some other things. Just joining us, feel free to ask any questions at any time. So we're, we're going to pause here for a sec. Step. This is the view of Hyde Park. That's a new uh, a new condo tower going up, and that's a new student dormitory, Genie Gang. Behind those beautiful panels, uh, Roxel insulation <laughs> panels. And this would be a nice sitting area, reading area, whatever anybody wants to do with it. Detailing here? Yeah. So these, these bucks stand off. I mean, these uh, window trim, de, uh, trim casings stand off. Uh, and the cement board paneling will go right into this edge. So this protrudes from the panel. So, this is the Zender room. Before we go, let's just go out here as well. This is the west facing terrace. Uh, we've designed it for PVs. Uh, there will be there, it, that area is, will, uh, will handle eight photovoltaic panels. Hopefully we'll, we'll get more. This area up here will handle six to eight PV panels on top of that roof. So eight and six is 14. Hopefully we can get more. Hopefully we can get at least 15. When we put the garage in in the back, we'll get another five or six uh, on that. And we'll have at least 9,500 kilowatt hours of capacity. So we're, I really want to uh, install the Sonnen battery uh, system. And the Sonnen battery system in a PV array really takes, you know, really takes, takes this house essentially off the grid and truly means, and means truly that it is a zero carbon house. In this, in, it's my understanding, and I'm not an expert in photovoltaics, but in certainly in urban environments when you're grid tied, the way it usually works, as I understand it, is whatever energy, your PVs are producing energy, and they're going to the grid first and foremost. When you pull energy, whatever energy you're, you're using comes from the grid. So if you, if you, in our case, if we drive down energy, total energy demand to 9,000 kilowatt hours in this house, if we, if, uh, you know, if we, ha if we had 9,000 kilowatt hours of capacity, we're still consuming 9,000 kilowatt hours from the grid. 
In this environment, natural gas is one-fifth the price or more or less than electricity. In other words, electricity from ComEd is five to six times the price of natural gas. And, you know, that, that makes it difficult. That's a challenge economically. But um, the point is, natural gas, you know, re, uh, produces one kilowatt hour of natural gas translates into about 1.3 1 to 1.5 pounds of carbon. Where, and, and for ComEd, in this, our, our electrical uh, electricity provider, 30% of its source energy is nuclear. So one kilowatt hour from ComEd translates into one pound of carbon. So if we don't do PVs, and if the total energy demand here is 9,000 kilowatt hours for all sources, we're still gonna be producing 9,000 pounds of carbon. Now that's a, that's a radical improvement over an, an identi a similarly sized house in this neighborhood. <laughs> the, there's a house for sale nearby here. It's a, it's a graystone. It's 3,500 square feet like this house. Its energy bills, they've disclosed it, are $6,000 per year. Now that's a combination of ComEd and, uh, and people's gas. It's $6,000 a year. By my math, that translates into about 132,000 pounds of carbon. So with uh, the, 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 the uh, sense-making crisis, if you will, or the, re the sudden realization, the profound realization in doing this project really is that, guess what? If you build to the Passive House Institute building standard in Chicago in a conventional row house, you probably can take that house off the grid because because you only need about 15 photovoltaic panels. And, you know, that's, that's amazing as far as I'm concerned. So what does the Sonnen battery do? The Sonnen battery is a smart ba uh, battery and grid, grid management uh, uh, assembly, if you will. It consists of lithium ion batteries uh, in a beautiful case. Uh, it sort of blows Tesla out of the water. And it's got smart grid management. So, you know, when sunny and hot, it fills up the batteries. When, you, when the house needs energy, it draws from the batteries. The excess gets kicked off to the grid. It's the right way to do it. I really want to do it and uh, debating it. It's a money issue, but. So even if they don't get um, solar right away, uh, I mean, you've done, you've made this project solar ready, so in the future yes. they can. It's solar ready right. and it's zero, zero energy, mm -hmm. zero carbon designed. Right. There's the, there's the, there's the conduit right there for the, that takes, that goes down to the specialized sub-panel for the PVs. There's another one up on that roof. And, you know, we're all set to go. Uh, that right there is the Mitsubishi air-to-air -air heat pump inverter. And uh, we have seven zones of air-to-air -air heat pump uh, uh, cool, heating and cooling uh, you know, our system consists of the Mitsubishi air-to-air -air heat pump uh, solution. And so far, it's, it's wonderful. Very simple, very easy to install. No ducts? No duct work. Right. No duct work. Hate duct work. Big problem. Duct works are problem. So here's the, one of the areas where we had to use polyiso uh, simply because of a, of a setback condition. And this is a, the R value of these walls up here is a really, really, really high because we had to build behind this wall is, uh, this wall consists of steel studs. We had to have a three hour fire rated wall. We couldn't do CMU up here, so we used steel studs and we used Roxel inter, interstud interstitially, uh, dense uh, polyiso on the outside. Um, as the insulating exterior insulating layer, Roxel interstitially, and it just turned out to be a lot of Roxel interstitially, a lot of Roxel up here uh, in eight-inch uh, joists, roof joists. So we have the roof. Um, well, we can just see here. This roof is about has about 16, 16 inches of insulation. So does that roof over there. Um, on the roof, we have we made a Roxel and polyiso sandwich. 
the thinking being that the polyiso would stiffen up the rock sole a bit. Uh, it's six inches of rock sole and one inch of polyiso, two three inch layers, mm -hmm. rock sole, uh, polyiso in the middle. Mm -hmm. Similarly up here, and then uh, rock sole, uh, eight inches of rock sole in the joist, about I don't know, seven or eight inches above the deck too. So here's some of the here's here's some, you know because there's Contiga tape. This is uh, Tescon Vanna, I believe. Oh, I forget. We call it, yeah Tescon Vanna. Um, so one of the one of the interesting things, one of the requirements of passive house is to mitigate and remove thermal bridges. Um, every, every, every building though at a right angle and a corner creates a thermal bridge. You good to go? Yeah. Okay. And when we ran our, when we took our thermal image gun after it was all in, after, and that's just another inch or so of insulation on the inside on the frame of the window. Um, that reduces the uh, effect of that difference. If you looked at the, the thermal image camera, these corners would be blue. And so that's not a good thing. Uh, actually, you know, you don't want cold on the inside. And um, so we added more insulation here. The trim will come, the, the final trim will be, you know, above here. And it'll look all nice and neat and still so far. This will be boxed box in. Here's our, here's our uh, Munster Joinery triple pane tilt and turn window. Um, it's three panes of glass. It's tilt and turn. That's a, a European feature. So now it's, now it's locked down and super airtight. If you want to add a little ventilation, you do that. If you want more ventilation, you do this. And uh, one, two, I'm not sure how many, one, two, I don't know how many. It's, I want to say five points of locking, but I may be mistaken. But it's, it's really super tight, and it's a Passive House Institute certified component. Um, this is the Zender unit. This is the Comfo 550. It's not working, it's not turned on, we're not, we haven't commissioned it yet. Um, the continue air comes in continuously from right over there. It goes into the box on one side and it comes through here and it goes out to, to 12 different areas within the house. The areas being the living room, all living areas. And uh, so mm -hmm. they, they have 12, 12 tubes of supply and 12 tubes of extraction. And they're, it's continuous and it's balanced. So C CFM for CFM. And after uh, somewhere, somewhere downstream from after it comes in, there's a MERV 13 filter. I actually don't know where it is, but it's it. There, so by the time the air gets to the actual living areas, it's filtered at a MERV 13 rate, uh, MERV 13 level. MERV 13 is operating room standard. So now In, you, incoming air, right? Yeah, yeah. the incoming air yeah. is makes its way through the Comfo 550 and then gets distributed through these 12 tubes. Mm -hmm. But when it's distributed, it's pushed through a MERV 13 filter. Mm -hmm taking out 90% of the, over, well over 90% of the dust, pollen, airborne bacteria, and so forth. It then, it then is extracted continuously from kitchens, bathrooms, and closets, mechanical rooms, and so forth. Comes up here, goes over, goes to this side, and then it goes out over here. So the, the magic is, is in the medium between the left side or the front and the back of the of the unit itself, whether it's front or back or left or right, I just don't know. 
I just don't know off the top of my head, but sure. we could look at a diagram. The point is that it's the, the two chambers of air are mutually mm -hmm. exclusive from each other. Mm -hmm. They're hermetically sealed. The medium in the middle is the conductor of the energy from one side to the other. So if it's zero degrees outside, air comes in. It's 70 degrees inside, air goes out. The 70 degree air migrates across the medium and warms up the, not, the zero degree air coming in. And it does so at an efficiency of between 80 and 90 percent. So if it's 90 percent, that air gets, that zero degree air gets juiced up to 63 degrees. Out it goes to the living areas and, you know, people running around the living of the house and so on and so forth. In theory, uh, takes that air up to, uh, you know, temperature, design temperature, mm -hmm. which is 70, 68 degrees Fahrenheit to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Right. So, um, yeah, that's the Comfo, Comfo Air 550. Looking, really, really looking forward to getting it operational. But that'll be very, that'll be near the end of the project. Because we still have to paint the walls and do all that bathroom tile work and all that. So, so, and real quick too, from a from a health standpoint, I mean, we're looking at um, hardwood floor in here, uh, so no carpeting other than maybe rugs. No, car in. no carpeting, hardwood floor exclusively. Yeah. The we haven't decided about the basement, but like I said on the, when we came in, this these are these are wide plank, rift and quarter sawn, white oak mm -hmm. boards procured from an urban forester. Mm -hmm. In, in Skokie, which is just before Evanston. Mm -hmm. And um, they were milled locally by Lee Lumber, right. uh, an established multi-generational, I think, uh, lumber company uh, two or three miles from here. Mm -hmm. They're gonna be, they, we've put down the first coat of tongue oil. Tongue oil is 100% natural, organic uh, product from the tongue. We'll have to do several more coats, but Eventually, yeah, it's every bit as every bit as uh, durable mm -hmm. as you pick it polyethylene, mm -hmm. polyvarathene, whatever urethane finish. But we're not going to do that. No, no, no VOC. Uh, VOC. This is a VOC-free environment. So no VOC paints. No VOC primers, paints. So, yeah. In fact, we've taken it as far as we can go. This drywall is CertainTeed Air Renew drywall, which, which absorbs VOCs and based on the 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 actual chalky material inside the paper mm -hmm. yeah. it it renders the v, it you know renders the VOC right. inert so so, so the certainty uh, St. Gobain now yes right product it uh, um, pretty much will eat any of the formaldehyde right that's yes. given off in the house if there is any so yeah people yeah. generate VOCs and, but um, the other point is that all the porcelain tile that we'll use we're not using stone. We're using porcelain tile or porcelain slabs. They, you can use slabs of porcelain now. Mm -hmm. um, it will be, it is photocatalytic, antibacterial, and uh, we're probably going to procure it from Crossville, yeah. which is a big US company. Um, photocatalytic, uh, the photocatalytic process, uh, you know, again, renders VOCs. Uh, VOCs inert, and, and that's the antimicrobial an, one, right? Anti-antibacterial anti yeah. as well. It's in wide use. It's you know uh, wide use in this country. Yeah. In public spaces in particular, right? Uh, uh, big and big box retailers like Walmart, right? Use it in restrooms and all places. But right. you can place it. You can put this process. You can run any tile through this, and Crossville manufactures, you know thousands of different tiles and so we're looking forward to doing that. We might do the basement um, garden level. Uh, we haven't put flooring down in there yet, but we might do that uh, there as well. Oh, every 1,000 square feet of photocatalytic tile, every 1,000 square feet of photocatalytic tile does the same amount of air cleaning is 25 medium trees. That's a whole, that's a lot. Sure. Try to plant that many in here. What's that? So try to plant those all in here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
That's like both sides of a, of a city block, 25 trees, if you're lucky. <clears throat> All right, so now, oh, well, we didn't, let's go back here. This is a chase for the Zender tubes right here. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of them. This is our, uh, one of the, this is the rear bedroom, nice and cool in here. This is, this is a Matterport picture, so this is what's behind the drywall. Dense packed cellulose. Uh, you can't see it, but we we actually measured each joist cavity. Back in here, because this is an exterior wall, it's the rear of the house, it's about 12 inches of uh, insulation here. And this, since the, the terrace is above us, uh, we have uh, rock sole, we have about seven inches of rock sole above this, above this, uh, I don't want to say drop ceiling, let's just say it's a service cavity of sorts. Um, there's, uh, there's the roof, the actual roof joists are above, mm. above this uh, two by four structure. So the same is down a little bit here, you can see it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we, we do have, we do have a service cavity in the first floor and the second floor. We don't have one in the basement, but we don't have a lot of resources in the garden level, rather, which is eight and a half feet tall, but mm. we just, we just don't have it, uh, that there. We don't have it on the third floor either. So, yeah, so this is the bedroom, the little bedroom, and no light. Mm -hmm. Closet, still needs to be finished. Bathroom, um, wall hung toilet, single van. You know, is it paper? Uh, Not paper face? Which you mean in the bathroom? Yeah, yeah, like it's a it's a a, a blue board. Yeah, they call it blue board. Okay, I don't know if that's paper. To be honest, that's I, a good question. Yeah, I'm not sure either. I just I know sometimes they have that darker look to them. So well, this is cement board. Yeah, yeah, and then in all the all the wet areas, yeah. anything that's possible yeah. being wet, we've used blue board. Is that uh, is that code or <coughs> is that something you guys did as the? You know, don't the know, but I mean, so. know from experience that yeah. that's the only way to yeah. go. Yeah, you know. Um, uh, and I know Passive House doesn't call for water conservation, but just, I mean, are you doing anything with low flow devices? Uh, the answer to that is I'm, I'm, uh, I'm making the call to not go out of my way to mm -hmm. use. I personally don't, this isn't Northern California, mm -hmm. you know. I understand that more, you know, we should all be good stewards of the mm -hmm. water, but we don't have a lack of water in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, we're using low flow toilets, but not the super highest concentrate, you know, sure, minimal, sure, sure. minimal flow. Yeah. They just don't work well. Mm -hmm. That's been my experience. Mm -hmm. We're not doing gray, anything with gray water here either. We're not, we, we have a perfect spot for uh, rainwater collection for the plants. There you go. Um, so we'll probably do that. Um, it's a leg up on many homes, right? <laughs> yeah. And this is the second bedroom, kids' bedroom, if you will. Uh, every bedroom has a every bedroom has a zender supply. You can see it up here. This one has two tubes. Every room has at least every bedroom has at least two tubes, and it's on a separate zone for heating and cooling. And everybody gets to control their. Uh... Everybody controls their own the way they want. This skylight is uh, uh, Lamalux, uh, European manufacturer. It's a it's a Passive House Institute certified component. And this this window, well, skylight window well was buried under the original roof. Mm. So why I don't know, you know, because obviously it lets in a lot of light. Sure. <coughs> Here's the master bedroom. This is what it looks like behind the walls. This poster is on this wall right about here. And so this is the common wall. 
and we've, ins we've insulated the common wall, uh, probably two inches on average. Uh, and you can see up here, we have, this is our uh, airtight uh, vapor barrier on the, on the taped up, stapled and taped up to the roof joist. Above this is at least nine and a half inches of, of uh, dense packed cellulose. Mm. So the, the roof, the ceiling here, the ceiling here is drywall. It hangs on a service cavity. Above the, above the drywall is the actual, or the actual roof joists. The actual roof joists going from west to east are on slope downward. The minimum cavity is nine and a half inches, but in some places it could be 12. So um, that's just the way it sort of worked out. Uh, I guess what I was referencing there is the, is the uh, never mind, getting confused myself. Anyway, stapled up, taped up, floppy mm -hmm. tail comes down around the sides. It's taped and caulked using uh, Proclima products and uh, it's taped and caulked to the, we didn't, we will get there, but our walls, our interior walls in the original structure are parched with lime plaster from the footings all the way up to the parapet. And that, that why lime plaster? Because lime, the mortar in the bricks in these old buildings is lime based, not Portland cement. And lime plaster provides an uh, air and water type layer, vapor open, and uh, it also fortifies the existing mortar. So, okay, so this is our, this is our master bedroom. You can see University of Chicago Hospital right through the window, up above the leaves there, and our, it's our landscaping in the front. Coming through here, two large master closets. Here we have the master bath, double vanity floating above the deck, wall hung toilet above the deck, no threshold shower. Uh, infinity drain, uh, rain head, uh, body sprays. This is what it looks like in gray, and this is what it looks like in white. Haven't made those decisions yet. But this uh, radiant heat under the radiant towel warmers and radiant uh, under, the, under your foot. That's a hygienic thing as well. Uh, dries out the towels faster, reduces humidity level, those kind of things. And that's electric radiant? Electric radiant, yep. So again, those things are all factored into our total energy budget sure. of somewhere between 9,000 and 9,500 kilowatt hours. <clears throat> this house, based on its square footage and based on 7.92 kBTU per square foot per year, that limit is entitled, if you will, to uh, approximate just a, t a nose under 60, uh, 6,000 kilowatt hours based on the square footage as defined by the Passive House Institute mm -hmm. building standard, which is not architectural square footage. The architectural square footage of this house is approximately, well not, it's 3,525 square feet, 3,525 square feet. The, in, the TFA, uh, treatable floor area, relative to the Passive House Institute building standard is just under 2,600 TFA. Mm -hmm. So 2,600 TFA times 7.92 gives you your maximum allowable energy use for heating and cooling alone. And in round terms, it's just under 6,000 kilowatt hours. The interesting thing is these Mitsubishi units and this Mitsubishi system have a coefficient of performance of greater than three. So depending on the ambient air temperature and other factors, the productivity of the unit uh, you know, ranges from a three, three to 4.5. But at three, the math gets simple. So if you have 6,000 kilowatt hours of heating and cooling demand over the course of a year to maintain the design temperature, and your units, your system is geared at, rated at three, 
6,000 divided by 3 means 2,000 kilowatt hours of energy. So 3,000 or 2,000 kilowatt hours of energy is the is the amount of energy that this building requires, given its geospatial coordinates and amount of glazing and type of glazing and insulation levels and so forth. It's the amount of insulation, uh, the amount of energy that's required to maintain the design temperature of between 68 degrees and 75 degrees to statistical certainty. Don't ask me to quote their, their <laughs> distribution curve because I don't know it. Right. But it's at least 90% of the time. Mm. So <clears throat> um, this house from uh, a, su a manual J load requirement, mm. which is uh, uh, HVAC standard, uh, you know, a re uh, condition. Mm. The manual J here is 25,000, the manual J load is 25,000 BTUs at five degrees and 95 degrees. So that's the amount of heat that this building will lose at five degrees, or uh, that's per hour as I understand it, and how much it will gain at 95 degrees uh, per hour. There's this other statement involved in the cooling requirement called latent load. It's 30,000 latent load and it's 25,000 heating load. Mm -hmm. that's, that's its manual J load requirements. So if you wanted to, in the conventional world, you would size your HVAC system for 25,000 BTUs of heating and approximately maybe 30,000 or 25,000 BTUs of cooling. That's about two and a half tons. That's an incredibly small system. Mm -hmm. And in theory, it's full blast at five degrees and 95 degrees. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a material distinction for the Passive House Institute building standard versus conventional. <coughs> By the, you know, as a, as, a, as a related matter, the IECC, so International Energy Something Committee, that's the, stand, the IEEC or the IECC, this is a standard that's been adopted by the state of Illinois. It's uh, as a as a building code standard. It's a it's a law in effect. Mm -hmm. It says that new construction has to be has to have 5.0 air changes per hour or less. That's the law of the state of Illinois, and 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 it's different for different climate zones and different states adopted adopt the metric differently. But it's 5.0 for the state of Illinois. And this house right now is achieving, uh, this last lower door test pre-drywall was 0.27 ACH. Mm -hmm. So substantially lower renovation and substantially lower than the 0.6 required for new construction. Sure. This translates into lower energy demand. So when we look at our final PHPP model, which every Passive House Institute building must, uh, you know, it's the guiding book. <coughs> We've had one, been working with it since day one. I think our actual forecast for given, given the insulation levels and given the ACH that we've achieved is actually coming in at around 5,100 kilowatt hours of energy per year. But again, it doesn't matter if PH, the Passive House Institute doesn't care, in, in effect doesn't care, how you provide that energy. Mm -hmm. It could be baseboard heaters, it could be wood pellet, wood fired stove, it could be anything. Um, we're using uh, Mitsubishi air to air heat pumps, which have a coefficient of performance of at least three. Mm -hmm. So that's better. We won't be, I do not expect to be, that this building will require more than something like 2,000 kilowatt hours of energy. So now we're going to go down to the living room and kitchen and gallery, and then we're going to go down to the guard level. That's a closet. We, we're, our permit allows us to turn that into a powder room, but powder room means more, more water, 
and it's not, we need closets in this space. <coughs> so this is our kitchen area. This will be a nine foot kitchen island. Uh, and this will be, this is a 16 foot uh, cooking wall. Everything, all the appliances, of course, are energy, sir. Uh, but we're using Mele brand uh, appliances. Uh, we're using Whirlpool for the washer and dryer. We're using A.O. Smith for the air-to-air -air heat pump hot water tank. And uh, the dryer is an air-to-air -air heat pump dryer, ventless heat pump dryer. And we're using Mela appliances up here. So we have a wall oven, microwave, induction cooktop, mm. and a 30-inch refrigerator freezer. And a hood of non-vented. So the hoods are not vented, the dryer's not vented. You'll use the, um, the, um, the, the vendor to do the ventilation. Well, the, 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 the vendor. vendor's using, the, that's right. And so when you, when you go into the kitchen, you'll probably turn the zender on to boost mode, which significantly increases the, the uh, extraction. Mm -hmm. And that's how, and we'll turn on the hood. The hood is a ventless hood with a, right. it's called a recirculating hood. Sure. Um, all right, we'll come back to this. Well, we can go through this room. So here, let's look at this. So here's a picture. This is, this is, we're standing, this, well, there's our, there's our Mitsubishi unit. And this is, this is the wall underneath it. Dense pack cellulose, dense pack cellulose, uh, new choice, rock sole, uh, rock sole over here, under there, it's the common wall. Uh, this, you can see our pink paint, again, not paint, it's a uh, Prosoco brand liquid applied air barrier. <coughs> this, is a, this is the end of the original house right here. Mm -hmm. So, and from here, from here forward, this next 16 feet, that's new construction, CMU, fully grouted, uh, uh, re, you know, reinforced, six inches, it's a three and a half inch firewall. Mm -hmm. So three and a half inch firewall, you can see our marks, that's four and a half, you know, it's about four and a half on this wall. It's about, I don't know, eight, 10 on that wall. And then on the outside is three inches of poly ISO. And here we have what the backyard is gonna look like when it's done. If you're standing where the car is parked over in the back there, you'll be, you'll be looking at the you'll be looking at the house like this. So you, you'll, there's egress right here to a basement staircase work. We're gonna get that in a few minutes. These are these stairs right here. And it's a beautiful landscape backyard. This is the uh, Sembrit Minaret HD cement board, fiber cement board paneling, open rain screen. Hmm. Um, and there's mommy or whomever in the kitchen mm -hmm. right about here, where, we're, where I'm standing. And this uh, is a, um, a detached oh, garage? This is a deep, yeah, this is, this is the, um, there'll be a garage door that comes down here, and this gate by code has to go up here. But, so it's secure from the alley, but it's open on the inside. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and there's a few reasons why, why that. Uh, I happen to believe that garages are very dangerous. Closed garages are very dangerous because bad guys lurk in alleys and they can, I had a friend whose wife was stabbed at, you know, taking the groceries out of a garage. Sure. So I would much rather see the car pull in, and stand there and watch the garage door come down and then have the, you know, the person walk down the path and up the back stairs. Mm -hmm. So it's also, this is steel, and um, it does the job. I, I, most people in Chicago that live in houses or apartments park their cars on the street. Right. Um, it's a challenge but in some neighborhoods, but this, this has two car, two car off street parking. And the backyard is, uh, 
There's six maple trees right there. We'll have more trees in the back. The sun has moved on, but earlier today, it was very hot in here. And the reason it was very hot in here is because of because the sun is hitting into this area longer. It's the summer. We don't have our shade trees planted yet along this line, along the south uh, property line. They will. That'll provide nice shade. We'll also do something on the exterior, a little cap, something above the windows. This is all for summer uh, sun mitigation. Mm -hmm. In the winter time, of course, the trees won't have leaves on them. And that's exactly why we've designed this with so much glass back here. So that's free energy. Uh, I'm not worried about heating this house at all. Um, this was, uh, we had an event. We missed that entirely, but I'll bring it back. Come on, we'll go back here for just a sec. <coughs> this is an event that occurred on or around January 12th of this year. This night was 10 degrees on its way to minus 3. It was probably about 0 at 8 p.m. when this event took place. We had, this is the, this is the parging, the lime parge mm -hmm. on the walls. This lady is not, this lady is not wearing a sweater or anything. We had two of these guys. This is a 1500 watt heater. Mm -hmm. uh, so even, we had two of these running. There were 50 people here. Of course, that has a positive effect on the heat, but we hadn't done any of the interior insulation. Sure. And it was still sufficiently warm with just two of these. So, um, this, is, this is another example of temperature difference. That's, that's, a, that's a tea kettle on a, on a gas-fired stove, and the tea, you know, there's a difference between the, temp the two temperatures. This is just another picture of what it looked like when we were... This is Martin. He's the installer of the uh, Zender unit and the Mitsubishi units. Uh, and he's standing about right where we are. Here's all our rock salt, most, a lot of our rock salt. And his happy face. Uh, so Zender, there's a Zender sub, uh, extraction there. There's a supply in the living room, there's a supply in the dining room, or we're calling that the dining room. It doesn't really matter, it's open plan. And there's an extraction in that closet. So that's, that's textbook, Zender, and everything Zender, everything Zender has represented has been true. Mm -hmm. It is terribly easy to install. Even I can do it. And can't wait to get it on. So here we go, downstairs to the garden level. And so we're standing, did those guys leave by the way? No, they just in the floor. Okay. Tell them they still got up there on the edges. There's quite a bit of work to do. Yeah. But they don't have a, the, the oil anymore at this point. So if somebody can, if you want to run, yeah, I know. Uh, you can go to Ace Hardware. So we're standing on the slab now. In prior projects, I've I've done uh, radiant in the slab. Um, you know, natural gas comes in into a fancy manifold system with a fancy wall hung boiler that's 95% efficient, and you have radiant tubes in the concrete. Maybe you do radiant tubes in some of the floor joists with reflector panels. <clears throat> None of that here. No gas in this house, it's 100% electric. The gas supply <coughs> right outside this window. <coughs> we don't have, we're not even plumbed for, on the inside for the gas. But if somebody wants to do it for whatever reason, it actually cost, would have cost me a lot more money to have it really removed. So we just capped it. Sure. We had to bring in, in, in the city of Chicago, to get a construction permit for anything, seems like anything. You have to upgrade the water supply. Now the water supply in the city of Chicago, they're at least 10 years behind the EPA federal requirements. 
There's lead pipes all over, and guess where most of them are at? They're in the poor neighborhoods. So anytime the city gets an opportunity to, anytime the city has an opportunity to, in, to generate a fee from the building permit, they're always on top of you know, the water supply issue. That, that number, by the way, is they jack the fees up for mm -hmm. getting the permit for the water supply. The, to the, the, permits, the permit fees alone for the water supply are about $8,000. So we have a brand new water supply. That's good. It's all we have copper, all, no, no problem, completely planned on it. <coughs> it's just an expensive line item. Underneath where we're standing, in the original, this house originally was about this high. This was the original height of the door. Uh, and um, so <laughs> we've added two feet net, just under two feet net to be precise. We're standing on a four foot uh, concrete slab and beneath that is six to seven inches of insulation. Why is it six to seven inches? Why isn't it just six or just seven? Answer, because the footing condition from the north side of the house to the south side of the house was asymmetrical. <laughs> so when you, you know, we, we ended up, we ended up replacing 100% of the footings. We ended up building, excavating, building stub concrete wall, reinforced concrete wall underneath an existing cut stone foundation which was re repointed from the inside and the out. There's some fantastic pictures of it all because it was a terrible thing down here. It was essentially porous. Mm -hmm. And the dry, this house when I bought it was just completely full of mold. And we ripped all the mold out and when uh, the moldy drywall out, when we ripped the moldy drywall out, we discovered seriously degraded joists because the previous renovator, so-called renovator, just whenever he wanted to make a cut, he just cut a joist randomly. There were several. There were several that were cracked. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very, very degraded building. Anyway, that's what we did. This is uh, on the back side of this because the wall here is mm -hmm. the 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 footing is about two feet wide. Then you go down to about an 18 inch wide foundation wall below grade. At grade, which is right about here it transitions into three widths of brick. So you have going from wide to narrower to narrower, and then on the second floor, it's, even, it's only two widths of brick in the original structure. So um, we, have different air, we have different levels of insulation. Right here, it's about eight inches. In the front, it's about eight inches on the inside. Then you have the mass wall. Then on the outside, you have another three inches of Roxel insulation all the way down to the bottom of the foot. And so, yeah, we have the slab, then we have underneath the slab seven inches of, six to seven inches of foam insulation. There's no thermal bridges because the exterior insulation is lower than the interior insulation. Hmm. So, this is our mechanical room. We'll have a air-to-air uh, -air heat pump hot water tank here. We have a whole house uh, water filtration system here. Reverse it's, osmosis? It's not reverse osmosis. It's, there is a UV component to yeah. it, but uh, it's highly filtered and then it finally gets sapped with the UV. Is there any reason you're doing whole house versus just tap? Yeah, because it's easier to manage, and uh, it's easier to manage. And people want when they they you know some people have they want to bathe in in uh, in you know high quality water rather than you know less yeah. than high quality. All right. Uh, washer dryer here. Uh, bath here. Shower. Toilet. Vanity. Mm -hmm. um, well, with the time we have left, why don't we why don't we head out? And, sure. Yeah. So this is our this is our electrical panel. It's 400 amps. The overhead wires have been buried. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, this is a 30 amp sub panel. That will be for the PVs and essential, essential components, ventilation, refrigeration, some overhead lights. Mm -hmm. um, and this is also our telco closet. Mm -hmm. And then we go up these stairs. This is all new construction. Massive amount of light comes in here, especially in the wintertime when the sun is lower. And here we are. Get a back side here. Yeah. And that's all the poly ISO up there? Yeah, that's all poly ISO. And that's the addition. Yeah. Yep. <coughs> <coughs> also kind of a good shot of it right in front of the house where we were. You can just see the uh, difference here between the poly iso and the uh, yep. and the rock wool. Yeah. So you have all sorts of messed up conditions on the exterior wall of the original. It's five inches here in, in rock soil. There's a couple chimney protrusions mm -hmm. that presents difficulty. The real challenge, we were going to have this flush. We are going to have it flush. But we're not going to have as much insulation as I thought we'd have. I thought we'd have six or seven inches right in here. Mm -hmm. But guess what? These screws, they're seven and a half inches long. So we couldn't find a manufacturer of longer screws. All these screws for all these battens, uh, generally are seven, five to seven and a half inches long. So five inches are easy to find. These guys are, there's only no one place to get them. So that's, that was what, that's, that's what happened with that. Um, this has been on this, been on it this way for, this, can, this exterior condition has been this way for at least nine months. And I'm not happy about that, but uh, man, this uh, the expense of installing the cement, the architectural cement port panel has been very expensive. It's not cheap like Hardy Board. Hardy Board is really inexpensive. You can find a do you know dozens of people that will do it e readily, but anything that's not Hardy Board, you're talking to commercial people and they want they want an arm and a leg so it's been hard to find the right guy we found the right guy we're going to get started on this next week <coughs> and we're going to get this finished hmm. so what would you just say you know obviously one of the biggest things we hear <coughs> about doing these kinds of builds is just the massive upfront costs and especially if you're either doing it on spec or even if you're doing it for a consumer um, you know there's either difficulty obtaining that much from the, either the lender um, or getting the value out of the house um, so what are you seeing when you're being able to do this well this project is way over budget um, it's way over budget because not because of anything related to passive house design details mm -hmm. It's only because of unforeseen conditions like having to replace 80% of the roof joists because they were just too screwed up. Like, uh, like having to do 100% of the footings when we didn't really expect to do the footings at all. And, um, you know, we had to haul out a lot of sand out of there. We're sitting on 35 feet of sand in this area. So that's a good thing and a bad thing. I mean, it wasn't. It's not a bad thing at all. It's just, you know, there's been there's been additional expenditure based on unforeseen structural issues. Not the passive house stuff is all transparent. The the unforeseen structural work is not, and you just don't know that it's a, it's a risk in renovation. Now, I thought this would be the perfect candidate because it had this large south elevation. Exposed. Well, that that's not that's not the right answer. 
it's it, in in the next one and but the premise of renovating <coughs> excuse me row houses in the city of Chicago which there are tens and tens of thousands math there are tens and tens of thousands <coughs> of mass masonry buildings in Chicago all are passive house institute renovation candidates because uh, because of because they're there already and <coughs> excuse me <coughs> So, um, the point is that uh, an interior row house will be substantially easier to, to renovate mm -hmm. to the Passive House Institute building standard. Hopefully it's wider as opposed to narrower mm -hmm. because you're going to lose some interior dimension when you, when you build the new frame. Mm -hmm. But the, the reduction, the savings in energy because you're insulated on both sides from some neighbor is, is big time. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, about general, I'm, I'm, I'm con more convinced than ever that in new construction, it's, it's virtually a wash in terms of expense, all else equal. Mm -hmm. Watch your head there, by the way. Don't, don't hang your head <laughs> um, the, there. There, there, there's a lot of sort of production, how uh, new construction, not too far from here. They're typically 3,000 square feet. They have the same open floor plan, five bedrooms, basement. They have hardy board sides. It's a frame house, brick veneer front, and they. I mean, they they cost. Let's say they cost two hundred and fifty thousand to build. A few more dollars, maybe, and you have a Passive House Institute certified building. So why? Because you're not spending money on HVAC equipment. The amount of money that I've spent between Zender and this over-the-top Mitsubishi system is is let much and the installation because there's no ductwork is, I think, materially less than I would otherwise spend on a deluxe, uh, on a, on, I mean the systems we're talking about go for the forced air systems that are comparable to what we've put in here are probably twice as expensive. And so we save, we save a lot of money on that. And so I'm, I'm excited to do the next project. I want to do new construction. Uh, this is very hard, but we've achieved many milestones here. and. Um, you know, I'm happy that I was, when we did our first blower door test and achieved point three six. I was jumping around. I was so, so excited. I, I really didn't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. So, it really needs to happen here in, in the Midwest because, and it's, it's harder to do here in the Midwest probably than any other place simply because you have radical changes in temperature mm -hmm. and humidity and you need to have vapor open walls you need a lot of insulation because it does get cold here it does get hot here unlike the bay area in san francisco mm -hmm. and they you know the the major major realization for me is that if you build to the passive house institute building standard chances are you have enough room on your roof to take that building to completely off the grid. And I mean zero is it's a race to zero. And you know that's a that's that'll be great. I mean I if we all if this whole city did that, then ComEd turns into a network, you know, the wires are still there. Mm -hmm. It's just that the juice flows the other way. Right. And what's wrong with that? Mm -hmm. You know? That's that means zero carbon. And we all know that that's what that's the objective. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what else can I tell you? Hi, I think that's it. Um, really, thank you for your time and having us out here. Um, for those who are going to be around in the Chicagoland area on um, Saturday, what is it, the twenty second? Twenty second and twenty third. Twenty third, they can come check this out live yeah. for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, We're going to have tours. They 
they've done USGBC, who's sponsoring the tour, has done a great job organizing. There'll be volunteers here. There'll be water here. I was going to try and get a barbecue going, but that's not going to happen mm. because of the weather. But we will have refreshments and there'll be tours. The architect will be here. Uh, the other the vendors, the many of the vendors will be here for the various building components. Right. And uh, looking forward to it. And for those who weren't paying attention this whole time, where can they find out more information about what you're doing and if you're interested so, in this house, right? Yeah. <laughs> they can Google Kenwood Passive House. Uh -huh. They can Google Ellis Passive House. Uh -huh. You can spell it the, in the German way or you can spell it English spelling. It doesn't matter. This is, this is it. All right. And there's, there's a lot of information on that website, not just about this project, but about Passive House in general. Uh, uh, and in particular, testimonies from many, many people about how comfortable it is to live in a passive house because of the consistency of the temperature and every in every surface and the quality of the air, the, the uh, acoustical separation as a consequence of the insulation and triple pane windows. Um, and the, the, you know, if you're a wealthy person, you might not think about $6,000 a year as a, you know, as meaningful to your lifestyle. But I think most people <coughs> that, that own a house <coughs> middle income folk, you know, $300 a month in savings in energy expense can be can go to a lot of different uses. Health care, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, IRA contributions, paying down your mortgage. And I'm excited to, to do, I, I, I'm looking for opportunities to do scale versions of new construction homes. We've been designing them smaller format homes, median priced homes, um, and, and taking this passive house concept to a larger audience. Uh, that's, how, that's how we're gonna bend the curve uh, down. Great, great. Well, thanks for your time. We're gonna right. go ahead and wrap up. So All right. Take care. Thank you. Well, thank you for watching, and thanks to all of our members, our board of directors, our volunteers, our staff. We could not do this without their support. Thanks to our major sponsors, Sun Intuitive Self Tinting Glass, Build Equinox CERV Smart Ventilation uh, VOC Detection, Geo Comfort Energy Efficient Geothermal, Niagara Conservation, some of the lowest flowest uh, flowing toilets on the planet um, and uh, water devices as well as Panasonic ventilation for all your ventilation needs and certainty air renew uh, formaldehyde eating VOC drywall. Uh, how do you get your continuing ed? And whether you're watching this on our channel or on the USGBC channel, complete that 10 question quiz with an 80% passing rate and you will receive your certificate. Thank you.